This is Sound Notion, the weekly podcast for new music and music news. I'm Dave McDonald. I'm Nate Blyton. I'm Sam Merciers. And this week we are joined by longtime friend of the show, Mirene Shim. Mirene, thanks for getting up early in San Francisco. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks for having me on. So if, if you are a longtime watcher of the show, if you've been watching the show since, say, like March of two years ago, um, you're, first of all, probably related to one of us. Second of all, uh, you've seen Mirene on the show before because Mirene was uh, one of our very first, if not our very first, guests on the show. Um, and we're very excited anytime we can, we can convince her that it's, it's, it's worth her 8 o'clock on Sunday morning uh, to be with us. So, Mirene, first of all, you've got a lot of cool new projects. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about this new percussion, flute and percussion duo that you have? Oh sure, um, it's <laughs> another another uh, new music chamber group. Um, me and Chris Jones, um, Christopher G. Jones, because as I learned, uh, there are lots of Christopher Joneses out there in the music <laughs> world. So this is the percussionist in Chicago named Chris Jones. Not I, I noticed that you've got a lot of people that have to specify their middle initial in this project, <laughs> in in the CD project that we're going to talk about. Yeah, I guess they don't have to, but in Chris's case, yeah, it's pretty necessary because there's a um, also a composer in Chicago um, who just um, started teaching at DePaul. Him, his name oh, is man. also Chris Jones. He's a composer, and um, he's got to go. Well, <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. So I guess I just never had to. Exp- I mean, I just don't have experience with having a, the same name as somebody else, but <laughs> Chris does. So yeah. Uh, I can I can imagine that that's not a problem that Mirene Shim has to deal with. No. Um, so, tell us about this uh, this duo then. It's you and a percussionist. What kind of stuff do you do? Uh, we are actually going to focus on music that's been specifically written for us. So we are really interested in um, new new music. Um, not that we're not going to play any of the existing stuff, but um, we got started because I needed a percussionist to play. Um, the piece that I commissioned from Janice Mizra Mitchell, which is on the new CD. Um, and I needed to find a percussionist and found Chris and we hit it off and we decided to like keep on doing it. So we actually just started, we have, we're in the process of um, commissioning and finalizing contracts with 10 composers right now. Um, we have as of yesterday, we have um, seven officially signed, ready-to-go contracts um, with seven composers. So we'll, we're expecting at least seven compositions over the next three years. That's very exciting. Any, yeah. Anybody, anybody you want to mention? Um, sure. We have um, Ken Reno. Um, and last night, we finalized um, a signed contract. Um, <laughs> I knew this was going to happen. That's all right. <laughs> Okay, more coffee first. <laughs> that's, that's what Sound Notion's all about: is music and coffee. That should mm-hmm. be our that's our new t- tagline. It's no Here's... no more <laughs> no more new music and music news. It's new music and lots of coffee, yeah. um, which is a little redundant, maybe. Um, so that's very exciting that you're you're striking out and getting all these new commissions. Is this something that is this a, a common medium? If it, I'm not familiar with a lot of flute and percussion repertoire. Is this, so is this like a new medium that you're trying to start? Um, well, I mean, it's not it's not brand new. Um, but honestly, I really can't think of too many like standard flute and um, percussion pieces. But then again, I mean, before I started working with Chris, I had you know limited experience working with just another one percussionist. So apparently, um, according to Twitter, there are a few there are a handful of standards. Um, so we'll probably explore those as well. But um, we're both like, you know, really into new music. And I know Chris, sometimes he plays with um, Ensemble Dal Niente and a um, and bunch of other new music projects in Chicago. So we are both sort of on the same page uh, about, you know, wanting like new cool stuff. Okay, so thankfully, since we're on, I'm on the computer, I can look <laughs> up all the names of the composers. <laughs> you got to play it cooler than that. You got to pretend that you're just recalling this stuff. That's what we uh, do. Yes. No, That's I what we do. That. Yeah, I read from Wikipedia it, like a champ. <laughs> awesome. So you want to rep your composers? 
So uh, let me um, plug the composers for the the um, first batch of AB Duo commissions. Uh, we have Jenna Lyle from um, the Chicago area. These are just the finalized ones. We have a few more that we're waiting to, you know, finalize. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we have Drew Baker, also from the Chicago area. Um, Carolyn O'Brien, also from the Chicago area. Um, Matthew Joseph Payne, who wrote the um, flute and Game Boy piece. That's on my new album. Um, Chris was like, we need to have a piece. So I said, that sounds awesome. Let's have another piece. So Matt's writing a piece for us. Um, Zach Browning is writing a piece for us. Um, and actually, um, Zach wrote a lot of percussion stuff. So that's why um, I remembered that he wrote a lot of percussion. So I checked him out. And we didn't know him that well, but we will soon. Yeah. So and Ken Ueno. And, oh, and Ivan Trevino, who's also um, a drummer. It, se it seems like this would be a very... Uh, when I th think about this medium as a composer, it seems like it would be a very tricky thing to balance those two. Because when I think of percussion, I usually think of loud sounds. And when I think of fluid, I usually think of softer sounds. Um, yeah, oh. But we have technology now. And technology, <laughs> yes. We have the technology. Um <laughs> Well, when, when we perform The Art of Noise live, um, I'm always amplified. Uh, I mean, the balance with the vibes is great, but, um, you know, when we have, like, break drums and other stuff. Yeah. You know. So I can't you're, play you're usually amplified with this group then? Yeah, prob most, most mm. of the time. Interesting. So then do you ever play with that? Do you ever use any extra stuff? with the amplification oh well, it depends on the um composition but i really really hope so and i expect to with some of the stuff that we're going to be getting excellent so and any of these commissions these are just flute and percussion or there there's so there's electronics with some of these as well oh yeah yeah they're definitely i mean uh matthew joseph payne is going to write us a piece for flute percussion and game boys so Fine. yes that's awesome so that's that's maybe a, a good place to uh, to get into your your album, this new album, uh, the Art of Noise, which uh, has a title track by Janice Mistral Mitchell, who I think we the last time you were on the show we played a piece of hers that that you had recorded, um, and another uh, track on this is this Matthew Joseph Payne, uh, Flight of the Bleeper Bird for flute and Game Boy. So tell us about working with Game Boy. Well, luckily, um, I mean, Matt is an expert at using um, this program called LSDJ, which uh, is the program that you use to program the sounds that come out of the sound card um, in the Game Boy. And so I guess the Game Boy has, um, the sound card has four available channels or whatever. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, you can program each one to play simultaneously or one at a time. And so we use the software LSDJ to program it. Um, Matt programmed it and wrote out the flute part uh, with a, a little bit of, you know, some cues, LSDJ cues. And then um, he gave me a couple Game Boys and he didn't even like set it up completely. He basically said, oh, here's the hardware. I'm gonna email you the files. And then you need to get this old version of Windows <laughs> and then you need to get this a special USB cable. And then here, here's the manual. Go figure it out. And I was like, oh, okay. But I figured it out now. So now you're like 80 times smarter having and, been able to do that. Uh, yeah, sure. At, at the very least, officially a chiptune artist now. Which is yeah. a pretty cool thing. <laughs> yeah, chiptunes is something we've we've talked about chiptunes a little bit on the show before. Um it's a, it's an interesting thing, and in, in in particular with respect to the 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 kind of canonical chip tunes, the uh, the Game Boy thing is a really interesting project because it's this you know arcane thing that can essentially be very closely imitated with any of the dozens of computers that surround us at all times. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm wondering if you've ever thought about just you know, putting this recording on your iPhone or something and playing it back from there. Would that you, would that change the piece? Or do you think, like, having it on this, you know, 1987 gaming console 
is part of the work. Well, you know, that's a really good point. Um, and I wondered that myself, you know, for traveling and simplicity's sake, because, you know, when I was just touring and whenever I have to perform this piece, it's you think, oh, flute, great. You can just put it in right over your shoulder. No, I've right. got a whole boatload of <laughs> equipment now. I have a, a mixer, two Game Boys and like all the special cables and um, pedal and crazy. But um, actually, it's a really good question. Um, <clears throat> I'm really glad that Matt wrote it this way. The second movement of Flight of the Bleeper Bird has a section for the Game Boy that's called Roboto. Not Roboto, but robot Yeah. Um, <laughs> and he wrote it so that it's sort of randomized. Um, every time you play it, um, some of the durations of the notes are varied. So actually, in that case, um, I do need to play it with the Game Boy. Because every time it plays that section, it's a different version. Huh. So how does that uh, how does that come across to the audience? Do they do they know that this is like a unique realization of the electronics part when they hear it? No. Yeah. Do you but tell I, them? Um, I mean, I have, but it I don't do it all the time. Because... Okay. I, I I would imagine that not all audiences would probably care. Um, that's a, an interesting thing um, that is maybe unique to the the that particular. Is there any other way, Nate? Have you done any any uh, Game Boy stuff before? Is there? Do people do this with anything other than LSDJ? Um, I haven't actually done it myself, but I know that there's uh, like there are plenty of emulators that where you can make those same sounds inside a PC or a Mac using. And most of that software is still based in old Windows or DOS kind of thing uh, platforms. Um, I know that uh, I have I have some friends that are doing a similar kind of thing, but using other software built into like a Nintendo DS, which might be a little bit more stable and have a little bit more flexibility, but it would of course sound different and. Um, so, do yeah. you think it would sound different playing it from the Game Boy or playing it like? from my my pc emulating a game boy i well since you're an expert in all things that plug into other things i i, I wouldn't call myself that i would i think and the reason you know that i would is that i just did I, I i wish that i could like you know relay this question at tristan parrish because yeah you know. <laughs> where's tristan parrish when you need him <laughs> exactly um i mean because this is a piece of hardware and even though it is like digital stuff happening inside, it's electronics making the audio, and there's always a little bit of different play with tempo and different things like that. And so the, uh, it's not going to be exactly the same, even if the programming says that it's going to be exactly the same each time. And it sounds like you've got something that makes it even a little bit different on top of that. Um, with, it, Did I hear you right in saying that... Uh, it plays a different section of the piece or something like that? Not a different section, but it um, it actually does a little bit of fake rubato. Like some of the oh, notes okay. are buried. Yeah. Which is interesting. And and of course you can you can use computers to do any variety of interactive things like that. Um there is something like using a Game Boy and then having the the different cables that need to hook up with that might be simpler than Having a computer that you need to That's start true. up, have an audio interface, and do all all these extra things. It's probably um, more reliable. Yeah. <laughs> and um, actually, well, I don't know about reliable. It's um, <laughs> one, one of my um, game boys uh, died or had uh, a little uh, incident um, right before a show. Uh, but um, one uh. as a performer, though, there is nothing cooler than like having Game Boys out. Like, yeah. what's cooler, having a laptop out or a Game Boy? Definitely a Game Boy. You're absolutely right about that. It's an awesome visual. And your street cred is, like, way up there for actually having, like, put the stuff on it yourself and having to get Windows 98 or whatever to make it work. And, and it's great. And this also, um, with AB Duo, you guys did uh, a short tour this this winter. Um and I would imagine that having that piece on Game Boy made it a lot easier to travel, right? Well, then on laptop? Yeah, or then some other computer system. Maybe not. 
No, I think it would have been simpler <laughs> just with yeah. <laughs> it's It was worth it. Do the Game Boys themselves run off of AC power or batteries when you're doing a performance? A uh, battery. Yeah, it's a, it's amazing. You don't you're you know you're this expensively trained classical musician, and then your life and your performance can hinge upon whether or not you've got any uh, double A's, yeah, <laughs> any hot nine volts with you or whatever it is that it runs off of. Oh yeah, no, I I I have like a whole. I probably had like twelve double A's and um. Alkaline double A's and 12 like rechargeable double A's and like it, it was every night it's like are all my devices charged and then you know are all my batteries charged so, that's awesome that's it's not very exciting now I I seem to remember seeing that you were doing something on Twitch is that am I imagining that uh, a Twitch TV Mirna the uh the you were streaming a concert or something is that? Am I making that up? I don't know. <laughs> Forget I said anything. Oh, 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 oh! There was a, a show that I did that was a chiptune show that was, yeah. um, you know, yeah, was streamed live. But it wasn't like my show. I just had, I just played. Okay. Super bird on it. But it was, um, it was like a, it was on Twitch TV, right? This gaming thing. Do you feel like there's an extra audience that you're bringing in that? would be interested in interesting uses of Game Boy, but maybe not as interested in a recital of contemporary flute music? Yeah, definitely. That's, uh, that's, that's what I was going for with that. Um, yes. Um, I have like way more people who are interested in my music um, because of Matt's piece because of the Game Boy piece. Um, but, you know, the fun thing is people who are interested in that kind of thing, um, they're sort of open-minded to listening to other stuff. And so the other one other piece on uh, my album, which sort of goes really well with the Game Boy piece, is Mercurial by Jay Batsner. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people are, like, really surprised and intrigued by that piece as well, which is for flute and tape. And, and the it, tape part there is... is uh... Is is pretty different from the Game Boy sounds, though. Yeah, but it's, it's like it's such a cool sonic experience and yeah. really different. So, uh, looking looking at this album, you've got uh, a lot of old friends here. Uh, Dan Danny Felsenfeld, friend of the show, Danny Felsenfeld, and uh, Janice Mitchell Mitchell that we already mentioned. Um, Tell us about so a lot of these pieces you're 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 doing these chamber works, uh, if we call a, a Game Boy a, a co-performer, um, <laughs> for these groups of people, which I think is very very cool. Um, you, tell us about this uh, this Felsenfeld piece that's on here. Well, the Felsenfeld piece is I think the the reason why um, we met in the first place, right? Because right. Um, I had this Kickstarter to raise money to. Um, to commission that piece, and finally, it's recorded and it's out. Um, That's very exciting. Yeah. Congratulations! That's the end of like a three-year process now, right? A long process for sure. <laughs> um, but I'm really happy with the end product. Um, I, Danny wrote an amazing piece. I, I just can't be happier about it. Um, and Lori Lack and Paul Rhodes. Um, they just, just, they're just so awesome and so professional, and they sound great on the on the album. And I am just, I'm so thrilled. I'm so thrilled that we, I was, we were able to raise the money for the piece, and now it's out there. It's a really great piece, and every flutist, cellist, pianist should be playing it. And actually, I mean, there's like the piano part is so good. I mean, it's really not a flute piece. I would call it a piano with flute and cello piece. All right. So this is um, a, a pretty, like I said, a long process that has come to a very successful conclusion with this, or not conclusion, but fruition with the with this recording that started on Kickstarter. And I'm wondering how you feel about now that everything is settled, how you feel about your Kickstarter experience with a little more perspective. Oh, my Kickstarter experience was fantastic. I couldn't have asked for anything better. Um, I mean, it was amazing. <laughs> like, I, I think it helped that I was sort of on the beginning of the trend of, like, new music Kickstarters. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, Would you do it again? No. No? 
Why not? Uh, well, first of all, I already had asked like a big, I already had my one huge ask for, right. for my first Kickstarter. So I would feel like guilty if I had to do it again, asking, you know, my friends and strangers for, a, you know, to back me in a similar way. Not that, I don't know, maybe on Kickstarter, I don't think I'd do it again because um, <laughs> there's so many other projects now. Yeah. Um, I would have a hard time like being heard and I don't know from a lot of people I hear that you sort of get a virtual big eye roll when there's another Kickstarter uh, get, campaign. I definitely get Kickstarter fatigue for art projects. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But, but I, also, I, I found that it's a useful way to filter Kickstarter is to use other people and just monitor what other people are backing. Um, that seems to work. <laughs> yeah, it's a new. Uh, uh, that's a, a feature actually that I think is new since Mirinay's Kickstarter is that you can follow other people, and then when your friend backs something, it says, "Hey, Sam Mercier's backed commission a new flute piece from Danny Felsenfeld," and you say, "Oh, okay, me too." Um, <laughs> Get behind that. You know, I think I think it's just changed the way you need to uh, to attack a Kickstarter project. I think it's good to have some sort of cool deliverable that you can give people at the ten dollar, you know, level. Right. It's ten bucks. If you're like Dave McDonald, you you'll compulsively spend ten bucks on Kickstarter, you know, <laughs> when the barometric pressure changes. To, he's, to, he's for a, a device that will change the barometric pressure. <laughs> exactly. <That's right. laughs> uh, Dave is a Kickstarter junkie. Absolutely. That's awesome. I wouldn't go that far, though. I am wearing a watch. From Kickstarter. It's not a watch. <laughs> so much more than a watch, well, Dave. Sure. Um, <laughs> uh, so, what what is the uh, what's the reception been for the CD so far, Marine? Uh It's been really great. I mean, it's so much better than my first CD, which you always hope. <laughs> um, yeah, it helped. Definitely helps that I have the you know chiptune enthusiasts. Right. Um. I mean, the very first like official review that I got for the CD was from a, a chiptune site. Really? Mm. So did they review the other pieces on the CD as well? Well, it wasn't. It was. Um, it was on Tumblr, so it's not like. Oh, okay. No, it's whatever. <laughs> so it's a mini review. Um, but it was really positive. Um, you know, they they mentioned that they liked the rest of the album too, which is great. Yeah, that's yeah. very exciting. So you so you are doing some serious new music outreach here by including this uh this chiptune thing that has oh, a, yeah. a really uh what's the word a, a really energetic a really uh, loyal Grass following, following. For, yeah. for this for this Game Boy thing um and it's very cool that they're they're into the other stuff is there a lot of stuff that's out there that includes both live performers and chip tunes? Um, or is it, not, was that like a new thing to this person? No, um, not. I mean, not in the art music kind of world, sure, but sure. in the you know pop and rock um, kind of world, there's tons, tons. So um, I played this show um, called Rockage in San Jose, and I was like a you know a blip on the roster. I mean, there's some huge. Um, bands and groups with uh, with large followings, and they have everything from um, Megaran, who's this rapper, um, and rapper and DJ. You know, they have this show, and they're fantastic. And uh, it's like he's his freestyle is so good, and he and his DJ. Um, you know, they use music from like or influenced by like Mega Man and other um, game, you know, games, uh, retro games. And then there's like, uh, I don't know, like metal bands, you know, yeah, who yeah. use like chiptune. And then there's just straight up like, like rock bands. And then there's like more electronica bands. I mean, there's just so much and, you know, real live singers and instrumentalists with programmed chiptune stuff. So this is a new thing then as well that you are playing for different audiences live, um, and do are, I, I? What's the reception like there? Do people dance 
to to your to your perform I'm this sounds really interesting to me. Yeah, it's it's great. I mean, I just can't tell you how awesome it is when you play for a crowd that's visibly excited and happy to be there. Um <laughs> Not that, you know, like classical music audiences are like not happy to be there, but you can't. They're tell not very demonstrative. <laughs> yes. Right. Less, right. less good at expressing their emotions, maybe. Yeah. Right. So it's like a it's a different kind of a rush. I mean, there's a reason why, you know, rock musicians stay poor, but yet keep touring until they die, because it's like it's that kind <laughs> of that kind of performance experience. There's no drug I can't imagine that would yes. be. As Mary, I think I think you found your your calling is performing new music for rock audiences. Oh, uh, I don't know. <laughs> I, have to, <laughs> I have to pick and choose the pieces very carefully, but sure. yeah, I would love right. to. You don't and you I, don't so, think they would dig? Uh, you don't think they dig some barrio sequenzas? Um, not <laughs> not <laughs> without some other. Just put oh. <laughs> underneath it. <laughs> And then play a burial sequenza. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm guessing, Marinae, that at this performance, you didn't have any trouble getting the audience to start clapping in that part where you encourage the audience to clap, right? No, not at all. <laughs> I, I, that's got to be the coolest part when you say, everybody clap, and everybody immediately starts clapping enthusiastically. Yeah. yeah. Do you have yeah. a problem doing that with classical audiences? Um. Well... When we were when we were on tour, I played that piece three times. Um, one time it was just for like like a room full of college kids, so I knew that they would be there with me. So I did that. The second time um, it was a sort of a small crowd, so and I was like, I have to do whatever. So so I did, and that was fine. The third show, I wasn't quite sure about if they, they were going to come with me because mm -hmm. it was in a fancy uh, concert hall. So. Um, I sort of didn't do that. <laughs> well, we've been talking about this 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 Game Boy piece a lot. So I will put in a tease right here. We are going to not only play audio, we are going to play a video of a live performance of uh, this, or at least part of this piece, uh, The Flight of the Bleeper Bird, at the end of the show as our pick of the week. So you should stick around for that. Okay. Uh, and if we had if we had a sponsor, this would be an awesome place for a sponsor read right after that tease. <laughs> That's right. Just, Can I be a just sponsor? Just throwing read? that out there. <laughs> <coughs> Say what, Mirna? Can I be your sponsor? Totally. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, um, okay. One more thing about the Game Boy piece. Um, so it's <laughs> so I am not like an avid gamer myself, but I am at heart a geek, like like a technology geek, and so this project was like perfect it sort of brought in both of my loves of um, computers and technology and music and I sort of took it to the nth degree um, we made a um, a seven inch oh that is cool Flight of the Beaver. Uh, but not, not it's I mean the seven inch is cool but I mean I'm not like a huge like record like Nazi either but um let me see but I, what I did was I, I saw this um, like chiptune metal band have they sold CDs out of five and a half inch floppy um, thingies. <laughs> so I bought a hundred eight inch floppies. I cut the tops off. I made a sticker. <laughs> oh man! So and you open it up, <laughs> put in the the seven inch. Bam. Like, awesome. That is the coolest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> Everybody you. buy that. Where can yes. where can people buy that? Uh mirinay.bandcamp.com. All right. Oh, Everybody yeah. got that? Mirinay.bandcamp.com. Do it. You have to get a turntable. Pause this pause this podcast. <laughs> go do that and then come back and hit play. <laughs> so seriously, like this is like my favorite part over the process of just being able to combine like my geekiness to the next, take it to the next level. So I yeah. just had to share. No, that's awesome. 
Brilliant. And and we thank Mirna for her support of the show. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about some of the cool things that happened this week. Um, oh. perhaps the coolest thing that happened. Sam, were you gonna say something? I just have to groan every time orchestra news is gonna be going on. <laughs> you don't like the orchestra. <laughs> this is good news. The San Francisco Symphony is back and playing music again. They already started. <laughs> just as we were like sort of in as much as Sound Notion goes to press, just as we were going to press with last week's episode, uh, the San Francisco Symphony published a press release saying that they had reached a tentative agreement with the musicians, and uh, while everything is being ratified, the musicians agreed to come back and start playing again. They played their first concert on Tuesday during the day. It was like a kid's concert kind of thing, so they agreed to come back on Sunday afternoon, and they were already back at work Tuesday morning. So congratulations to everyone involved in that issue. And, you know, let's observe how wonderful it is that even though they went on strike it was less than 10 months you know this was uh like a two and a half week strike Mm -hmm. um the contract is not uh publicly available just yet we imagine or uh, so basically everything i know about orchestra business i learned from reading drew mcmanus's adaptation blog Uh, he expects that we should um be seeing full copies of the agreement in the next few weeks so hopefully when we when we do that we'll be able to have more to say but something that i thought was interesting about the the agreement was that it's uh 26 months which seems on the short side to me um some of the other contracts that we've seen get uh, signed in in the last few years have been three years or more uh i think i've seen some that were as long as five or seven years so um it, we'll probably be talking about this again in the not too distant future. So, Sam, save your groans. Yeah. <laughs> right. Start saving them up now, because we'll we'll be right back here in a few in a, in a few years. I'll uh, just sit here in my typical stoic silence as usual. <laughs> all right. Well, for example. <laughs> 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 So, uh, another interesting little tidbit, uh, the Kusevitsky commissions were announced, um, I guess, just this week. Uh, Kusevitsky Music Foundation, uh, named for Serge Kusevitsky, uh, and some some big big names. Uh, we got Tristan Morel for Yarnwire, uh, Kaya Sariajo for De Camera of Houston, Ronald Bruce Smith of, uh, and writing for the Del Sol Quartet, Kate Soper writing for Alarmal Sound, and Wang Ji uh, uh, writing for uh, in the League of Composers. So that's some some cool groups that are going to get some money. Now, they don't say how much the awards are for. That's what but, I was gonna, does anybody have any idea how much those are? Uh, it's a secret, Sam. Mm. Just I, I checked just to uh, to see how their awards went. There's an American, French, Finnish, Canadian, and Chinese American represented in those people. Represent. Wow. Represent. So that's very cool. So the big question is why is Dave McDonald, Nate Blyton, and Sam Mercier is not on that list, right? Well, right. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that we didn't apply. Well, yeah. Because oh, yeah. Yeah, if, if we had, done deal. <laughs> Is that an apply thing, or is that is that a get nominated kind of thing? I'm pretty sure it's an apply thing. Um, so, congratulations to all of those people. We'll look forward to uh, the music that comes out of those commissions. Uh, next up, there was a piece in the New York Times. I guess this is a week or two ago. Uh, from, I don't know. It's April second. Just this, just a few days ago. I totally was about to lie to you. Uh, from Tony Tomasini, pointing out. Uh, the kind of cluster something that is going to be the the new art center at the World Trade Center site. It was decided many years ago that one of the ways that we were going to memorialize September 11th, 2001, was going to be with a performing arts center. And... One of the problems with calling something generically a performing arts center is that 
you are saying that this is a space that is for all the performing arts. This is a space for theater. This is a space for dance. This is a space for music. Um, any performed work you can imagine should be here. Now, what, the problem with that is that all of those different art forms have very different needs for what this space should be. And so uh, Frank Gehry is designing this building uh, and he's he's done amazing work with performing arts spaces before, at least in, in particularly in music. Um, you'll know if you've ever been to see the Los Angeles Symphony that they have a, a, an amazing concert hall uh, designed by Frank Gehry. I uh, just last winter attended a concert at the New World Center in Miami, which is an, another beautiful Frank Gehry performance space. And he's going to I'm sure design something really amazing and beautiful for the this World Trade Center Memorial Arts space. But the problem is, what should it be for? And so the the goals of this project keep shifting and changing, and nobody is quite sure what uh, kind of performance space it should be. Do you guys have any thoughts on uh, on what kind of performing arts space would best serve uh, this World Trade Center site? Anybody? Uh, Sam? I think it's interesting think? that um, you, the the uh, World Center, the new World Center in Miami Beach, the one you were just talking about, um, they were contrast the $154 million price tag of that, which is a huge, impressive thing, right? Right. To estimates range between 300 to 700 million is going to be whatever this thing is. So it's it just that to me is an interesting thing having to do with scale and and uh, you know well, the new just, world it, center it, is relatively small um, yeah it's not a it's not a huge space so I mean I don't know how big the footprint that's been assigned for this structure is but it seems like you know Tomasini's making an argument against interdisciplinary spaces. But if you've got seven hundred million dollars to spend, you could have you know a space that's got some designated areas that cater to the special needs of different um, disciplines. Seems to me, you well, got that much money to spend, you might as well, unless they're wanting to make something that will seat a huge number of people. Yeah, and it seems like the the to me, and this is this is what's pointed out in in this article is that it's really hard to make something that is great at everything mm -hmm. uh if not impossible to make something that is great at everything and there's going to have to be some compromises in favor of either dance or orchestras um and that's a uh something that frank gary just has to figure out i suppose um but it's also not clear what arts organization is going to be in charge of this. For a while, it seemed like there was going to be a dance company that would kind of be running the show. For a while, it seemed like the, there might be uh, a theater company. Tomasini points out that this would have been a great place for New York City Opera, which, mm -hmm. as we talked about uh, a while back, is homeless at the moment they they had a, a home for a while at i believe it was at the kennedy center or not the kennedy center the uh um lincoln, lincoln center. center goodness and uh now they're kind of bouncing around and playing a shorter season uh and they're in different venues all the time this would be a great place for city opera um and it has a lot to do with kind of the city opera mission of bringing this art to a, a, a wider group of people that might not ordinary ordinarily experience it. Um, so it'll be interesting to see what becomes of this. I don't know if there's anything we, we can really say from, from this perspective, but it's certainly an interesting read that I would commend to anybody listening to this show. Uh, and we'll have those links and more in our show notes at soundnotion.tv slash S N. Um, Probably the most interesting article that I read all week long was this next one uh, about the new music notation program from Steinberg. Uh, this is the team from the old Sibelius working group that uh, Avid kind of downsized and got rid of all these people at the UK offices of Sibelius, and they're starting from scratch building this new music notation system, and they have a great 
PR guy in Daniel Spreadbury, who's also heavily involved in the design. He's kind of the project manager or something. I don't know exactly what his title is, but uh, he just had a blog post this week, five months into this process about all of the work that has gone in so far and some of the things that are coming up. And he talks about these meetings. We talked a a couple of months on the show ago about uh, these meetings that they had with a lot of musicians in the area. So so things that they would like to see. He's got a photo of some of the notes that that were taken in those meetings, which I think were fascinating. Um, You can see if you're in the video, you'll see these. he talks about different ways of spelling accidentals and something that I thought was really interesting in this is he's got a heading of pitches and they want support for bigger subdivisions than 12 tone equal tempered. Mm-hmm. So uh, <laughs> not just playing those back, but also some way to, to notate them. And of course you should subscribe to this blog. And if you have any thoughts, so if there's something that's a base and finale, both are terrible at or both are great at that you want to make sure are included in this tell daniel spreadbury and we need to get him on the show uh sometime but this is your opportunity to have some input in in the initial ground level design of some really powerful and hopefully useful music software what could be super influential you know if this takes off and is extremely popular it could affect you know, a lot of composers in the next 20 years, 30 years, however long, you know. Uh, I, I think it's really interesting that they're taking serious the the sort of responsibility of making a notation program from the ground up and not having to, you know, deal with any legacy code or anything. And uh, they're also going out of their way. It's They had meetings with Boozy and Hawks and other, you know, uh, engravers. It's sort of the the blog post reads a little bit like a history of engraving. It's cool. They talk about the Halston process of engraving and you get some and that's where it's like a photo reduction where when they engrave it it's oversized and they ink it onto paper with a roller and like a just a, you know, what do you call that? A stencil. Yeah. yeah. And then you photo reduce that and that's how they do it. The thing that I had not heard of were these these um these dry transfers that they're talking yeah. about these like uh the the oh, what do you call those the decal kind of dry transfer things were mm-hmm. very cool as well um well, Nate, it's, you, i just go, go ahead. ahead i was no, gonna ask just nate cool, if he but... had any thoughts on the uh the the software thing because he's our software <laughs> there tech you go. person I mean, it's really exciting to me for the same reasons that you were saying of just having them build something from the ground up um in particular, like me as a composer, I'm I'm really interested in uh, a new notation software in general. I grew up like clicking in, clicking into a staff before I knew what notes were, and just kind of like getting relationships spatially and like, and then listening to it a lot. And uh, and then like a couple years after that, I started learning any music theory and learned what the no- names of the notes were and things like that. Yeah. Um, but so my compositional process has been a mix of just using my ears, using inside my head, and um, and then using this really visual element of uh, of what it is on a on a staff, and also graphically. And uh, the thing that I'm most interested in, like they they were talking about, uh, <laughs> like Finale and Sibelius don't do this, where they have where they really really integrate with. Uh, MIDI land really well where you can see it as a, a, piano, a piano roll, roll yeah. and, and you can link it with um, like look at things graphically and then do a good job of translating that into notation and giving you good tools for doing that. I, uh, I, I grew up using Cakewalk because um, the, way, <laughs> the way that you input notes to the staff worked the same way as uh, um, as many piano rolls do, where you you just click somewhere in the staff, and if it's, it's a, just about kind the of right like a place, graph. For, for, for people right. that aren't familiar with the piano roll system, it's just a graphical representation of all the notes. It's you know pitch over time, and you just you know if it's higher, you put it up. If you want it later, you put it to the right more. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. So, so it's very cool. I, and in fact, I th- I thought of you when I read that. <laughs> yeah. So in particular. You, Finale doesn't do a good job of this. If you click in an empty staff and put a sixteenth note, 
like two thirds of the way over to the right, it doesn't put it in the spot of like the the third half note triplet. It puts it at the beginning of the staff because there's not it's an empty staff, so it puts it at the st at the top. Right. Um, like typing left to right. <laughs> right, because that's that's what you do when you're inputting and doing notation. Like you start at the beginning. You you've got it in your head or you've got it on a different sheet of paper, and so you you're just like inputting and engraving. Right. So uh, the thing that I'm most interested in with this pro this new project is that it might be more of a composition software. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To me, and, I think that's something I would love to talk to Dan Spreadbury right. about. Because yeah. we, we, we do have good options for notation, things that can make you make anything. With, with the right amount of time, you can make Finale or Sibelius look like anything and do what you need to do. Mm -hmm. But actually, uh, so... I mean, I'm interested to see what it's going to be like compositionally. And they also talk a little bit about the other technical things with um, making it a more universal and having it speak better with other other programs and doing scripting and things like that, which I think using Music XML and Lua for <laughs> just like, I, I think there's a lot of possibilities. I'm excited to see where they go with it. Yeah. So, Mirne, do you uh, use any any of this kind of software? Do you use Finale or Sibelius right now? Oh yeah, I use Sibelius. And actually, as a performer, um, I think I I would I would almost be willing to bet fifty bucks that I can look at a score and tell you if it was written in Finale or Sibelius. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, because Sibelius looks so much better. So <laughs> as a performer, I'm very much looking forward to this new program because I'm assuming that it'll have the same kind of beautiful notation and fonts and what have you. Made by the people who brought you that nice look from Sibelius. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Like the, and these are the people that like originated Sibelius. These are, these are the, the kind of the core team that created all those, those great things that you love about Sibelius. And I think Nate, you're onto a, an interesting thing is that th this is essentially software that is doing two separate things. There's the engraving part of it uh, that that imitates the things that Sam was talking about with the crazy photo process or the stencil process, um, and then in the you know calligraphy and all that cool stuff. And then there's the other part of it that is for the composer, the 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 creative part of it that is related but still very different where you're serving people in the process when they don't exactly know what the final thing should be right there's the, the on the engraving side you essentially know what you want the final product to look like and you're just typesetting or something like that and then on the other side you're starting with nothing and not quite sure what this product is going to look like and figuring out the engraving later on down the road maybe or is is a is kind of a co-creative process with the actual composition of the work um and to me that's one of the big differences between F finale and sibelius is that sibelius shifts a little bit more from the engraving side to the compositional side and there are some tools that are that were integrated into there that kind of uh, f fed back into Finale. And to me, that's another interesting thing. And Sam, you, you kind of brought this up, is that if this is a new revolutionary thing that becomes popular, Finale and Sibelius are going to steal features from it, which is great. It's great for everybody to have that kind of competition. So uh, even if you don't use whatever this new thing is going to be called, I think you'll probably see some benefit from it, which is a well, really interesting it, thing. You know, students have been using this as a compositional tool since notation software was invented and it's just interesting to see what will happen if somebody really takes that into account when they're building the the piece itself like it's not just an engraving tool that you can make into a composition tool it's you know a composition tool and an engraving machine yes indeed so i'm interested to see what happens so in sound notion 6420 we'll do a <laughs> retrospective on on that on this thing five years later I'm writing Speaking right now. of technology, put it on the, put it on the calendar. <laughs> yes. Uh, sorry, Speaking I didn't mean to step on your awesome transition. <laughs> Speaking of technology and music, specifically new music, there is a um, post total toolkit uh, available on uh, the iTunes Store. 
Designed to be a one-stop, this is how they describe it themselves, the post tonal Toolkit is designed to be a one-stop app for pitch class and tone row analysis of post tonal music. It is the only app of its kind uh, in the iOS app store. Features include a PC set calculator, a subset superset calculator, and coming up, a matrix calculator. So those are fort numbers in that screenshot if you're looking at the video. Yeah. So you can punch in. This is a great tool for analyzing music or for studying analyzing music. It's, um, a, it's a great tool for helping pass your post-tonal analysis class. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I would think even if, even if you weren't in class, even if I was just trying to analyze a piece, if I could you know, throw four pitched classes in, into this thing and have it spit out the fort number uh on my phone i know that'd be a pretty useful tool and it seems like that's what we're that's what we're talking about here so you get you know, uh, all kinds of great stuff about pitch class sets you get fort number normal form prime form uh the interval vector uh z sets if they're there so uh great 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 tool um and uh if anybody checks this out and has a review of it let us know um you know it's it's interesting. I've seen all these different tools, perhaps on not... On the web, mostly, I think. Yeah, perhaps not every single aspect. But yeah, there's just different websites that have done these different things that I've known about. But it's really cool to have all of it just right in the palm of your hand if they had it for Android. Uh, I guess so you just need to get Nate, a new phone, See, Sam. Nate got up because he's shirking his responsibility to generate a post-tonal toolkit for Android. It's Nate's job. Yeah. So, Way to go, Nate. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm working on it. Uh, see, that's I, what he was I getting to up to do. He was getting up to start coding on his other exactly. machine. <laughs> nah, I need to learn how to use fort numbers first, though. I don't think I... <laughs> 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 Never really worked that out in school. Yeah. Now, for, for a completely different take on some music technology... Um, there's a space, uh, what is it called? There's some kind of space in Montreal where I Montreal. guess, I think what they're saying is every year they have an installation there. Um, and this year it's a uh, interactive musical swing set. Um, there's a video on the site. It's, it, you can, it's easier to understand what's actually happening if you watch it. But basically, um, you sit on a swing and you swing and your, the tempo of your swing generates a note and you establish the the time or the the tempo by swinging, um, but it also encourages uh, the guy that designed it, um, Al, uh, Luke Elaine Giraudou. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> that's Dave's that. job. <laughs> that's Dave's job. That guy uh, he made it so that certain things, certain musical behaviors, will only emerge when people do things. Um, together work in concert together so swinging in perfect uh you know time with somebody else or doing something like that will generate different results than just swinging alone and not just like contrasting the two notes that you're generating but it's amazing and it's a really really cool experience to be able to make music with your entire body we tried to figure out if we all went together at the same time, we would change the music. And it did. It definitely felt like, or the tempo was moving with us, and it felt like, almost like plucking or strumming, like a harp. So to me, why, why these sorts of projects are so cool is um, that, that they are giving normal people that don't have, you know, Fifty thousand dollars to get a music education from a university. Uh, the the power of, of creating a thing and creating and in this case creating it collaboratively, which is very cool, uh, and controlling it with their bodies, which is also very cool. Right, Nate? I think it's cool. I think there are other ways besides getting a fifty thousand dollar music degree. That was a joke. To share music that was with a people, joke, but... people. Don't send your Just send saying. your hate mail to at a Nate Tree. What? My email address is Nate Blyton at NateBlyton.com. <laughs> I that think... won't get you anywhere, which is good. Yeah. <laughs> An installation such as that where you can see a really clear connection between what you're doing and a sound that's happening, 
Um, I think it provides a very basic music education to people who don't even understand the very basic idea of different people doing different things at the same time. I mean, that sounds so, so simplistic, but a lot of people who've never had any music education of any kind don't even get that, that how that works in even the most simple way. And uh, this, you know, you're if somebody else sits down, you're immediately playing a duet, and you can see what you're doing and how it interacts with what they're doing. So yeah, really cool, absolutely, cool, 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 as Abed would say. <laughs> so yeah. our our last story this week is uh, an, an obituary we've got, and we lost a Pulitzer Prize winning composer this week. Robert Ward passed away at age ninety five. Uh, he won the the Pulitzer Prize for his opera The Crucible, based on uh, a, 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 the the play, and I was kind of surprised that this didn't get any more attention. The The Crucible is the only work of his that I knew. I went back and tried to find some others, some other recordings, and I couldn't find that much. Um, but uh, a great composer, uh, and The Crucible is a very cool opera if you haven't heard it. Um, well, we should link to some to a recording of the Crucible as well. Kind of surprised that the New York Times didn't give him an obit. Um, Marinay pointed out before the show that the uh, N- NY Times obituaries editor is kind of asleep on the job a little bit lately. So hopefully, uh, we have not heard the last of Robert Ward's music, uh, and we'll we'll look forward to to spending some more time with his music in, in the future. Uh, Pulitzer Prize winner goes with your name then you deserve a New York Times obit. That's what I'm saying. That's, That's all I'm, what saying. I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. So we should move on, Sam. <laughs> you know what, though? I, I bet uh, he didn't get it mentioned because uh, he didn't make good brownies. That's you know, I bet that's that's probably a lot to do with it. Because if he or if he had had some kind of cat that could do math. <laughs> Sam, Sam, what are we doing now? <laughs> <laughs> so our pick of the week as I teased earlier because I am a broadcast professional uh is of, <laughs> exactly uh is of, of course by our guest Mirna Shim and we talked about this piece a lot earlier the flight of the bleeper bird by Matthew Joseph Payne do you have anything Mirna that you want to say to set this up before uh we play this video no <laughs> All right. So this is uh, Flight of the Bleeper Bird. This is, this is the first movement, which is hilariously titled I Fought the Daw and the Daw Won.
So that was an excerpt from The Flight of the Beaver Bird performed by our guest, Mirene Shim, composition uh, by Matthew Joseph Payne. Thank you so much for sharing that with us, Mirene. That was awesome. Oh, I can't hear you because I did that. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, okay, how's this? Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, so uh, one of the things that I think is really interesting about the, the combination of flute and Game Boy is, and uh, I've, I've always found that kind of 8-bit percussion thing to sound like air. The the kind of... <laughs> you know what I mean? The sound, and it, and the, the combination of those sounds and the kind of jet whistle tone... Uh, extended techniques you were doing on flute is a really interesting combination. Uh, are, you, are you trying to to ever match the sound from the Game Boy? Um, yeah, I mean, there were actually technically there were no jet whistles in this piece, but um, yeah, Matt wrote some parts where he said just he basically wrote out a drum set part for me mm. and said um, just you know if make these sound like kick drum, make this sound like a hi-hat or whatever. And I tried my best because I'm not, I'm not a, you know, beatboxing expert, but I, you know, for some of it, it was easier to do than others. Um, so the parts where I couldn't sound like an actual drum playing that <laughs> fast, um, you know, I just made it um, sound as similar as possible because he did intend the flute part to be like a fifth Game Boy voice instead of just being like flute accompanied by Game Boy. Yeah. So. Well, I, that comes across. I think I I can definitely hear that. Nate, were you going to say something? I I guess I have a technical question, but <laughs> as I do often, <laughs> the, <laughs> I I saw you had a earpiece mic. Are you using that to amplify your flute? Is that? Oh yeah, yeah, definitely needs to be amplified. Um, I am I'm using a headset mic for this piece because um. Right before this piece on the concert, we played the Art of Noise, which um, which was for flute and percussion, and I I changed flutes on that piece, and so um, and I'm you know moving around. I just can't use a regular vocal mic, yeah. So or and I can't use a regular flute attached mic. So I've been using a headset headset mic. You've had good results with that. It's a... Um, it's it works really great, except for when I have to actually beatbox, because then. I, I have to learn to like just take it easy, or else it'll just blow out the. Oh sure. Yeah. Cool. That's very I, cool. Yeah, I had some friends that would do that when like playing violin or viola and have it have it kind of pointing out this way. <laughs> and <laughs> and I uh, I hadn't seen it with flute though, so that that seems like a a neat new tool as well. Yeah, I mean, cause um, you know, for art of noise, I have to sing and stuff too, so it just okay. it's just okay. easier. Yeah. <laughs> well, so. Do you have any any performances coming up that that you want to plug, Mirene? Um. Well, in on June second, I'm playing um, Danny Felsenfeld's piece to committee um, at the Cornelia Street Cafe in New York. Uh, so if you're there, um, and I'm really really excited to say that I'm I will be attending the summer festival um, for Bang on a Can. So hopefully, if you guys are in the area, I'll see you. Um, and before, before that, in between that, um, I'll be at the NFA convention. Cool. Um, I'll be around. Are you going like, to, you're going to play the Game Boy at, at the NFA convention? No, I'm playing a new piece by Danny Felsenfeld. It's the summer of Danny Felsenfeld. Yeah. Um, it seems like that's every summer. <laughs> it should be. That's the way it is, right? Um, I'm sure Danny would love that. Uh, Yeah. So he's writing a new piece for flute and piano. Um, well, actually, contrabass flute and piano. So awesome. I'll be premiering that there. Awesome. I would love to hear this contrabass flute and piano piece. Maybe we can yeah. get a recording of that. When that when when you have a good recording of that, you should come back on the show because I'm very <laughs> interested in hearing that. So th that's going to do it for this week's Sound Ocean. Mirene, thank you so much for being with us. It was a pl it's a pleasure as always uh, to to have you on the show. Thanks a lot. Um. If you have any questions about any of the things that we talked about on the show today, you can, of course, check out a lot of links to those things on our site, soundnotion.tv slash SN. We stream this show live every week at soundnotion.tv slash live around 11 a.m. Eastern Time. Next week, stay tuned for a programming change. We're going to do the show later in the day. Um, 
To accommodate our guest's schedule, next week we'll be joined by composer Alex Shapiro to talk to us about all kinds of uh, cool internet things that she does as a composer to maintain her career uh, and still be connected while living on a remote island off the coast of the state of Washington. So that will be very interesting. She'll be joining us from that same island. Um, So stay tuned, and you can catch that time change it'll probably be around 6 p.m eastern time you can catch that time change officially on our twitter account that is at sound notion um and you can also connect with us about any of these stories there as well uh individually or as a group we're at sound notion i'm dave mcdow nate is a nate tree sam is house goy and mirane is mirane <laughs> <laughs> because she doesn't have to use her middle initial ever <laughs> um because I, I would imagine there aren't a lot of other Miranays in the world is it nope. no none so you can find her at Miranay on twitter you can also find us on on facebook subscribe to us on on the itunes store and catch every episode you can support us using our amazon affiliate link on the right side of our page at soundnotion.tv uh and you can also donate there as well sound notions introduction sound notions introduction more coffee Includes music by Patrick Gulo and video by Tyler Lepp. Thanks again for watching, and we will see you back next week.